May God be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus and his disciples returned to Capernaum, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. So no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was standing around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brother and your sisters are outside asking for you. And he, Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives. Amen. There's a lot in this passage, and I could take a whole month preaching on this passage, um, and I won't do that today, other than to note... The tensions here. Jesus is doing, he's doing what he's come to do, and his family thinks he's crazy. And they try to restrain him. There's, I mean, they feel like he's, he's embarrassing them, and they, they try to stop him from doing what he's doing. The religious leaders think he's possessed. They think that what he's doing is demonic, which is really interesting. And they try to, they say that it's by the, the ruler of the demons that he casts out demons. They recognize that he has power, but they don't think it's God's power. They think it's a demonic power. And Jesus says, how can Satan cast out Satan? A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself will not be able to stand. And then later you have this bit about who are his, his mothers and brothers and sisters are there, his mother and brothers and sisters. And he says, who are my mother, brother and sisters? All these gathered around me are my mother, brother and sisters. We read this passage at a time that where, uh, as a nation, uh, Canada as a nation is wrestling with what does it mean to be community? What does it mean to be a people together? Especially when part of the community has harmed uh, another segment of the community, and how do we uh, heal and, and how do we achieve reconciliation from a long process of harm and hurt that has happened? And it's been brought to light and exacerbated this list last week by the, uh, the the discovery of 215 bodies, children's bodies that were buried at this school in Kamloops, a residential school in Kamloops. So. Um, there's a, our, our bishop has asked that we read a letter on this day. So I'm going to read the letter uh, that the bishop has asked. And he starts out by saying the discovery of a mass grave at the Canloops Indian Residential School. And he wrote this earlier in the week. And it feels important at the beginning to clarify that it was not a mass grave. And that clarification was made a couple days ago by folks that were there. A mass grave is, is a huge pit that's dug and then people are slaughtered and put in that mass grave at one, in, in a single instant or in a, in a shortened period of time. What they discovered was um, bodies that had been buried separately uh, and in, there were in individual graves over a, 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 an area of ground that had probably happened over time. Um, and that distinction is important. So this is from the bishop. To all the people of the Diocese of New Westminster, 
The discovery of the mass grave at the Canloops Indian Residential School and the remains of 215 children buried there has shocked us all. The reporting of horrors of abuse and brutality at residential schools is not new to us, but this burial site has brought into sharp focus the structural disrespect, cultural violence, and cruelty that took place on a regular basis. We cannot ignore that 215 children were buried without markers, without notification to families, and likely little or no ritual or ceremony of burial. How are we able to respond with so many emotions swirling around and within us? It is a difficult but painful truth that some of those children were potentially baptized in the Anglican Church and quite possibly in our Diocese of New Westminster. We have a connection to this ghastly discovery, much as it might shock us to understand that. A journey is taken one step at a time, and the journey of reconciliation is a lifetime pilgrimage, not something soon done and finished. We are on that journey, and we must seek ways to continue that and never give up. On August 6th, 1993, the then primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, Archbishop Michael Pears, said this to the Indigenous people of Canada, quote, I accept and I confess before God and you our failures in the residential schools. We failed you. We failed ourselves. We failed God. I am sorry, more than I can say, that we were part of a system which took you and your children from home and family. I am sorry, more than I can say, that we tried to remake you in our image, taking from you your language and the signs of your identity. I am sorry, more than I can say, that in our schools so many were abused physically, sexually, culturally, and emotionally." End quote. On July 12th, 2019, the primate of that time, Archbishop Fred Hiltz, said this, quote, I confess our sin in failing to acknowledge that as First Peoples living here for thousands of years, you had a spiritual relationship with the Creator and with the land. I confess our sin in demonizing indigenous spiritualities and in belittling the traditional teachings of your grandmothers and grandfathers preserved and passed on through the elders. I confess the sin of our arrogance in dismissing indigenous spiritualities and disciplines as incompatible with the gospel of Jesus and insisting that there is no place for them in Christian worship. I confess our sin in acts such as smothering the smudges, forbidding the pipes, stopping the drums, hiding the masks, destroying the totem poles, silencing the songs, stilling the dances, and banning the potlatches. With deep remorse, I acknowledge the intergenerational spiritual harm caused by our actions. I confess our sin in declaring the teachings of the medicine wheel to be pagan and primitive. I confess our sin of robbing your children and youth of the opportunity to know their spiritual ancestry and the great wealth of its wisdom and guidance for living in a good way with the Creator, the land, and all peoples for such shameful behaviors. I am very sorry." End quote. Those are the words of two former primates of our Anglican Church, words that have much to offer us now. But at a time like this, we need to listen deeply and intently and hear from indigenous voices, not only from settlers. Archbishop Michael MacDonald, National Indigenous Archbishop, re recently said this, quote, I once heard someone say that Jesus who died on the cross, also died in the Holocaust. If that is true, they will find him among those children buried in Kamloops. But we who have seen him die on the cross and suffer with us know that this is not the end of the story. 
He came back to us whole and sound in a resurrection body from a world to come. A world that he said could start, we could start living in now through love, through prayer, through the sacred circle, and through his body and blood. His justice, his truth, his love is walking in us and through us towards that day and we have seen it. It will rise, is rising with those children and with the truth that could not be hidden. End quote. This is a time to listen. To listen to the voices of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. To listen to their pain, their truths, their voices, their understanding. To listen to how we live into reconciliation, not with words alone, but actions that build hope and compassion and new life. To listen and find a way to keep moving forward on this path of reconciliation. Chief Robert Justice, Chief Robert Joseph once said, quote, true reconciliation fundamentally is about relationships. It means that you and I can coexist in mutual respect and all of us can afford each other dignity, end quote. May we live into this hope, aware of the harm and violence that has taken place, but seeking true reconciliation by listening and responding with action. With this in mind, here's a section um, of Roseanne Kazmier's Chief of the Tacomlops to Sequapum May 31st media release. Quote, Regrettably, we know that many more children are unaccounted for. We have heard that the same knowing of unmarked burial sites exists at other former residential school grounds. It was something that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission raised in the early days of their work. However, it was not part of their original mandate. We ask all Canadians to reacquaint themselves with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report and calls to action, upholding the heavy lifting already done by the survivors, intergenerational survivors, and the TRC. In addition, to show our solidarity, we encourage you to wear an orange shirt and start a conversation with your neighbors about why you are doing so. Tecumloops to Sequapum is now accepting donations that will automatically be deposited into a separate account set up for this initi initiative. The email is donations at kib.ca. There is no other fundraising initiative that the Tecumloops to Sequapum authorized or is participating in at this time." End quote. May God guide us, move us, guide us to move forward in ways that honor renewed relationships and with determination that there must be a change in how we share this land with indigenous people, how we uphold with respect and resolve the United Nations Declaration on, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of this country, the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples, residential school survivors, and those who have much to teach us about living out the gospel of grace and love. May God's blessing be on all of us in this crucial time in the history of this church and this country of Canada. Blessings and peace, Bishop John. We as a community, St. Lawrence, have begun this process of trying to figure out what does it mean to be a reconciling people um, at this point in time and in this world. And part of that is, is reconciliation specifically just with indigenous, um, our indigenous brothers and sisters. But to do reconciliation with indigenous brothers and sisters, you actually have to practice reconciliation in all aspects of your life. You just can't do it in one place. It actually needs to be something that you do in your life as a regular pattern. And that is actually what we're called to be as uh, followers of Jesus. That's at the heart of the Christian tradition is to, to practice this way of reconciliation, the way of healing, the way of, of being honest about sin, the way of confessing sin, um, the way of repenting and turning away from sin, and then the way of entering into restoration and forgiveness and grace. 
This last Thursday, one of our speakers, uh, Ray Aldred, who's the um, Indigenous Studies professor at, at the Vancouver School of Theology, spoke to us. And um, he spoke to us, he laid out very clearly the, the, the pattern that truth and reconciliation follows. And it's a really simple pattern. I was, I was struck by it. Um, and, yet it's, and, and, and yet it's so essential. And I think in many ways it's, it's really hard to do as we're experiencing. And the pattern is tell the truth. Expose the truth. Discover the truth. That's the first part. The second part is listen. Listen to how whatever's happened about the, the harm that's been done. So the first part is tell the truth about the harm that's been done. Second part is listen. Listen to those who've been harmed and hear how it's impacted them. With that will come the motivation to repent, to turn, and then come up with a common solution. A solution that, that both those who've been harmed and those who've done the harm can agree to and live into. And that is the path towards full reconciliation. I want to talk a little, just a little bit about that because I, I think it's very simple, but it comes up against some of our uh, deep, most deepest human resistances. Like when there's been harm done in a relationship, whether it's, it's interpersonally between like a, 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 a two spouses in a married relationship or in a family relationship or in a community um, as we are, when harm has done, it's really important to state what happened. That's why it was important to, for this news to come out that, no, actually, they knew that 50 children had been killed. There were records of 50 children that had been killed at this residential school, this particular residential school. Um, but there was actually more than that. And it's really important that that be acknowledged. That's why it's important that this news comes out. It's also important to be true about what happened. This wasn't a mass grave. It wasn't a, a single killing of 215 children that were then buried. It was, it was, a, a, it was a cumulative uh, process that happened over time, that happened over generations, so that these bodies are buried discreetly, without records, without acknowledgement. Often the truth is hard to hear. And the pattern of the reason why telling the truth and getting out the truth is, is so important because often when harm has been done, our tendency is to deny it. Our tendency is to minimize it. Our tendency is to pretend it didn't exist or gloss it over. And if it is known, very frequently the, 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 the tendency is to say, well, I'm sorry, let's be done with it and move on. Let's forget about it. And that short circuits the process all of those short circuit the process because harm has been done and, and all, of them, uh, all of those ways of covering over the truth or minimizing it or move, trying to move away from it and defend against it don't lead to healing. There's this, pest, there's this festering of the hurt and the harm that's been done. And that's true of the relationship between set indigenous settlers and, and uh, indigenous and settlers or newcomers here in Canada. But it's true. It can be true in a marriage. It can be true between parents and children. It can be true between friends. It can be true between people in a community. It's the same pattern. We need to tell the truth about what happened and expose the truth. And then listen. Listen to those who've been harmed and listen to how it's impacted them. Because when they open up and they share what's happened to them, it's actually a gift. It's a gift that, 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 that shows that they, they still desire relationship, <laughs> that they still desire to, 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 be in re, that, that, to be in relationship with you and to, to help expose what's really happened so that their heart can begin to heal, so that they, they can begin to reconnect. And too often, if, especially for those of us who've had some part in perpetuating the harm, when you hear how what's been done impacts the other, the feelings that arise are often guilt or often shame. 
And as humans, we hate those feelings. We don't want to bear those feelings. We avoid and we defend against those feelings of guilt and shame. Shame because we, want, we like to think of ourselves as being good, as being, as, as being decent, as being okay, and the shame makes us feel less about ourselves. And the guilt, because it, 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 guilt has to do with more with moral categories and a sense of like we've done something. And the tendency, if the tendency, our tendency, again, if the tendency is to kind of push those away, that's why the denial happens. That's why the, the covering over happens. That's why there's a, a move to quickly say, I'm sorry, as a way of covering over those things. Because they are hard to bear. If instead we take the bolder path, if instead we take the riskier path of actually tolerating, the, acknowledging the shameful feeling, acknowledging the guilt, that opens up the possibility of motivating us to act differently, of wanting to do it differently. Often when you feel guilty for something, guilt is basically saying, yeah, I did this thing. And I hate that I did it. I hate that I feel this. I hate that I, I've, I've, I've done it. And I don't want to do it. I want to I turn. I want to change. I, I, I want to change things so that this doesn't happen again. That's what leads to repentance, right? When you're able to step into shame or you're able to step into guilt and bear it rather than try to deny it or cover it over or run away from it, but bear what you're feeling in it. that can be the catalyst to say, okay, let's do it differently. Let's change the direction. Let's change what's happened. That's what repentance is. In that way, shame actually, when that repentance happens, and, and, and then, the, and then that, there's a, a move toward, to come up with a common solution, right? That's the third part. It's a, it's a solution that, that the the persons who are harmed and the persons who've done the harm can agree on at, at some level and, and share in the process, that they both agree that, that, that this is how the, the, the healing will take place, this is what the solution is. Um, that's what ultimately rebuilds trust, rebuilds connection, rebuilds the ability to live together in harmony and allows for the healing of the hurt and healing of the trauma so it doesn't keep coming up again. When that happens, shame is able to be turned into honor. And guilt is able to be returned into integrity and responsibility. When I first heard that about, you know, what was going on with these residential schools at this particular school, my first thought was, oh no, don't let it be Anglican. Please don't let it be Anglican. And I was relieved to find out that it was Roman Catholic. And I confess that to you. Because that is exactly, it's like, okay, I don't want responsibility. It wasn't me, it was, it was those people. That's what we, that's the natural human tendency. And as Bishop points out, some of those kids were Anglican kids. And similar things happened in the Anglican residential schools as well. And there's even, I've, I was talking to friends, uh, you know, some folks who grew up in non-denominational backgrounds, and they were sharing, well, they can feel like, oh, no, that's what the Catholics and the Anglicans and the United Churches did. That's not what the Baptists did. It's not what the non-denominational churches did. And that they then separate themselves from it. And I even think there's a tendency in Canadian society for a lot of Canadians to say, oh, that's what the churches did. The churches ran the residential schools. Without recognizing that the churches were just doing what the society as a whole wanted them to do in that moment. I know there's some of us who are like, we're immigrants to this country. We're like, yeah, that happened a long time ago. Well, we, we didn't do it. It wasn't our ancestors who did it. It was somebody else's ancestors. All of those are various ways of trying to, to avoid 
the trauma of what happened, of the pain of what happened, of the guilt and the shame that may arise as a result. The reality is, is that we participate in a culture and a community. We are Canadians. And this is something that some Canadians did to other Canadians. And we're still living with the result. And that makes it a matter of import for all of us to be involved in. I think as people of faith, um, we should desire that. We should desire to be involved in that process because this is the process of, that, that Jesus calls us to. This is the process that we're called to as, as, as people who believe that, that, that sin can be acknowledged and confessed, that people can repent and turn, and that healing and transformation can take place. That's what motivates our faith, and it should motivate us as well. And this is going to be an ongoing process in this culture. It's not going to end this year or the next. But it's a way of being. And I think practicing this way of being, of being people of reconciliation, is a way that we can be life-giving, spirit-bearing, God-fearing people in this world. Amen.